All right, we're back at it with a view from the zoo. This one's called Back Up Man. I always felt good about going into a cage with Bob Pedersen. He was the best backup man in the business. I was sure that if something went wrong during a dangerous animal capture, Bob would be there to do whatever was needed to bail me out. He felt comfortable with my abilities, and we really enjoyed working together. When it's necessary to go into a cage and capture a potentially dan dangerous animal, the first rule of thumb is that there must always be two or more people to handle the animal effectively. The first man works the animal into position while the backup man cuts off its avenues of escape. The roles can change back and forth when the animal changes position, but we usually decide who will catch and who will grab before we unlock the cage door. Bob had an excellent reaction time and he was strong. We netted and held everything from baboons to cheetahs and neither of us ever sustained an injury when working together. In fact, the only time that I sustained any injuries was when I broke the cardinal rules of capture. Number one, never go into the cage alone. And number two, never work with an inexperienced backup. It was a lazy summer afternoon in August and I had finished all that I had been assigned around the health center. I needed to get down to the North American section to vaccinate the Arctic fox, foxes for distemper, hepatitis, and leptospiriasis. They were overdue. I picked up the phone to call the section and then set it down again as a young and beautiful PhD candidate from a local university walked into the health center office. She glanced around and then asked me if there was anybody she, who could help her. I told her that I, I would if I could. She explained that she was doing a behavioral study on white-handed gibbon apes and needed to mark them with white paint so that she could readily tell which ape was which. We drove down the Eurasian section and I looked for the keeper who cared for the gibbons. He had already gone home for the day and I couldn't find anyone else who worked in the section. I noticed that the beautiful young scientist kept checking her watch. Running late, I queried. Yes, and I was hoping that we would be able to get the marking done today, she replied. She sounded so desperate, like maybe she wouldn't get her PhD or maybe that she would get an F on her assignment or something like that. It's just that I can't find anybody to do backup, and I'm not supposed to go into the capture situation alone, I explained. Gee, I'm really sorry to be putting you up to so much trouble. Your gibbons must be more aggressive than the ones at the primate center. Ours were easy. I even helped. Hey, I would be glad to help you. I'll be your backup. I'm sorry, I can't let you help. If you got bit, I'd get fired, I exclaimed. And she sat there looking so disappointed, so dejected, I had to prove that chivalry was not dead. And so I made a stupid decision. I, I guess it wouldn't hurt anything to try, I announced. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, you're a dear. Perhaps dunce would have been more appropriate word, but just for a minute there I felt like a deer. And it felt pretty good. I gathered the capture equipment together and carried it to the back of the gibbon cage. All three of the gibbons looked at the two hoop looked at the two hoop nets I was carrying and hooted their displeasure. Hand over hand they quickly retreated to the far end of the cage and huddled together for mutual comfort. They looked fairly intimidated and I took that as a good sign. Uh, I entered the cage with confidence. I had learned to act confident whether I felt confident or not. It gave you a slight edge if the animals were on the defensive. I left one of the two nets leaning against the cage wall and began to make my advance. The apes had headed in different directions and it, it looked like it would be every gibbon for itself. I made a beautiful pass of the net and whoosh I had a gibbon. I knew that it must have looked impressive and I twisted the net to make sure the gibbon didn't accomplish a premature exit. It was about this time that the other two attacked me with a vengeance. I couldn't have endangered more wrath if I had tried. The two remaining gibbons seemed to be coming at me from every direction at the same time. One got a large handful of my hair and decided to keep it. The other gibbon grabbed my arm with such force that it caused an impressive bruise. I wore it for more than a week. There is no dignified way to exit a cage while being swarmed by gibbons. 
Uh, I just did the best I could to get out without being bitten to pieces. That was exactly what the flying Gibonski brothers had in mind. As I fell backwards into the holding cage, the beautiful young scientist had the presence of mind to push the sliding door shut. The Gibbons continued to reach through the chain link, hoping to pull me back out where they could work me over good, but I had back just out of reach. Now, there is really nothing clever that one can say when one has just proven himself to be a jerk. But one usually tries to say something. I know I did. Well, miss, do you think this might be the why they recommend that we never go into the cages by ourselves? Maybe so, she answered with a smile and convinced me that I had looked as ridiculous as I had felt. I would have been grateful if we just could have left and forgotten the whole thing had happened. But there was still the little matter of one gibbon that, had, that I had netted. It was still neatly twisted and bagged and lying quietly on the cool cement floor. Be sure your sins will find you out, I thought. I had no choice. I had to get someone to help me release the gibbon and retrieve the nets. I managed to get my supervisor to come back with me, and together we quickly accomplished what I had failed to do alone. Next time you break the rules to impress somebody, you may lose a finger, an eye, or your life. Don't do that anymore, Richmond, he said sternly. We drove back to the health center silently, and I pondered my irresponsible actions. I never made that same mistake again, but I did make others. We had just hired Dr. Reed, a brand new veterinarian who had just graduated from vet school. Dr. Reed had never worked with wild animals, and capture was something she had seen on television, but had never participated in it herself. She was nevertheless my supervisor, and I felt obligated to indulge her requests. She wanted to get some practice at capture, so she asked if I would please step aside to let her grab an adolescent greater kudu. A kudu is one of the largest antelopes, and though the young male only weighed a little over 100 pounds, he could still accomplish some serious damage with his formidable hooves. Dr. Reed would make the initial grab and control the head, the neck, and the front legs. She must keep it from falling to the ground or it would be in a great position to kick somebody's head off. I was back up and my job was to control the hindquarters and keep it on its hind feet. The hindquarters are the business end, the end that can deliver the most damage. Dr. Reed rushed in and exhibited a good deal of pluck as she grabbed the young kudu. I grabbed the hindquarters and our veterinary assistant began to inject a large dose of penicillin. It was then that Dr. Reed lost her grip, and in trying to regain it, she actually tipped the animal upside down. The kudu kicked upward with all its might and knocked me temporarily unconscious. The hoof had passed through my open mouth and connected with the rear teeth on the opposite side of my head. My gums were bleeding profusely, and all I could hear was a loud ringing in my ear. When things began to make sense again, Dr. Reed was saying, Tell me where you are. Tell me your name. After I had convinced her that I had fully returned to coherency, I was removed for medical treatment. I made a decision that I would never again work without an experienced backup or lead. I stuck to this decision for the last two years of my zoo career, and to my memory, I was never injured in a capture situation again. So much of, of life lived at its best is a matter of surrounding ourselves with people who will provide good backup. They will put, out, put us out of trouble when we get into a mess. They will remind us that we are out of line and need to be playing by the rules. They will pour courage into us so that we can perform to the limits of our potential. Because we reap what we sow, it is necessary that we learn to be good backups ourselves. The following is a list of responsibilities to, that go with being a good backup person. If you have learned to love yourself and put yourself first, then you need not apply for this position because it requires a willingness to sacrifice and courage enough to live for others. The Christian version of backup is called one anothering. As you read the following list, think of people in your life who are good at watching out for you and caring for others. John 15, 12, love one another. Romans 5.13, don't pass judgment on one another. Romans 12.5, be members of one another. Romans 12.10, uh, 12, be devoted to one another. 
and honor one another. Romans 12.16, live in harmony with one another. Romans 14.19, build up one another. Romans 15.5, be like-minded toward one another. Romans 15.7, accept one another. 1 Corinthians 6.6, 6, don't make lawsuits against one another. 1 Corinthians 12.25, care for one another. Galatians 5.13, serve one another in love. Galatians 5.15, uh, don't spitefully hurt one another. Galatians 5.26, don't provoke or envy one another. Galatians 6.2, bear one another's burdens. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another and forgive one another. Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another. Colossians 3.9, don't lie to one another. Colossians 3.13, teach and counsel one another. 1 Thessalonians 3.12, abound in love toward one another. 1 Thessalonians 4.18, comfort one another. Titus 3.3, don't hate one another. Hebrews 3.13, encourage one another. Hebrews 10.24, stir up another to love and good deeds. James 4.11, don't slander one another. James 5.9, don't bear grudges against one another. James 5.16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Three more. 1 Peter 4.9, offer hospitality to one another. 1 Peter 5.14, greet one another. 1 John 1.7, have fellowship with one another. Now that you've read the responsibility of the ideal backup person, try to think of the people in your life who fill that responsibility for you. Why don't you write or call them and thank them? They deserve it. As you read through the list, did you see any verses that best stated some area of strength that you possess and use to support others? Was there an, a weak area? Close the book and thank God for the backup people in your life and your area of strength and ask him to help you grow in some specific area where you now show a weakness. We'll see you next time.